terrorists are going to be here. Mm -hmm. And I think the other harvest that we're reaping now is a generation of American servicemen and women who have been in Iraq, been in Afghanistan, who have come back and are saying, what was my sacrifice for? Mm -hmm. Right? Taliban is about to take over, as, as you and I were discussing, the Taliban controls pretty much as much territory as it did, say, in 1995, 1996. Iraq is not the beacon of Jeffersonian democracy, pro-Israel ally, great donor of oil to America uh, that was promised. And, and you now have people saying, well, in contrast to World War II, their victory, Korea, a draw, but then you look at, well, look how South Korea's turned out. Say Vietnam, finally, <laughs> 30 years later, you know, Vietnam looks pretty good. But, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, you have, so you have people in every community. You know, not, it's not just a DC think tank. You have people, in every, veterans in every community who are saying, what did we achieve? And so I think that's playing, that's another part that's playing into why we're seeing these dynamics in 2016. I wonder if this piggyback off of something you said that's actually a really good segue into an article that Rachel wrote about, and it's an interesting sort of disconnect between the, you know, perhaps some of the kind of the think tank uh, establishments, perception of threat, perception of America's role in the world, and so, and what, and what Americans, the American public thinks about our role in the world and threat. So I think there's a recent Pew poll, and I, I imagine that uh, other polling uh, organizations have confirmed this assessment. If you ask Americans, I believe today, what is the principal threat to American national security, I believe most would say ISIS. I think quite as, a substantial majority would say ISIS, uh, groups like the Islamic State. But I, I want to bring this article that, that Rachel wrote in which this was uh, also from the national interest. This was from uh, February 14th of this year, and I think a really, really interesting point. Uh, so, Rachel, you made the argument in this piece. You said that ISIS and comparable groups, they do not pose an existential threat to the United States. And you made the argument that rather, you're not saying that obviously that we shouldn't deal with ISIS or comparable groups. We should. But you said that the United States should put more focus on issues that can significantly change the international geopolitical landscape, such as a revanche to Russia. So, and so, so make make two cases. So one, to the American public, uh, who, you know, we see these horrific images on TV of ISIS beheading the ISIS actions, and to a lot of Americans, it's naturally you see that imagery, you think, of course, that's a principal threat. So one, make the argument that ISIS and affiliated groups are not, uh, that we may be overstated the threat. So make that case, and then make, so the second argument, which is why should we be focusing more on Russia or other, other threats? So I think when it comes to ISIS, I think I pulled a piece from, or sent it to from Stephen Pinker in there that says, terrorism is too capricious to predict. Mm -hmm. And we can spend money and we can spend blood and treasure trying to make sure that the United States isn't attacked by a terrorist or a terrorist organization. Um, and we can do that, but at the end of the day, it's so hard to predict when those things might happen that the amount of money we spent we spend trying to avoid it, you know, we have to question whether or not it's it's worth it. Um, at the same time, when you're looking at what's happening in Europe and Russia, you're seeing a revenge is Russia whose goal, I would argue, it's 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 its goal isn't to you know in, invade the Baltics or take territory from uh, NATO member countries, but its goal and I think it's succeeding in this goal, is to break down Western cohesion. And I think that that's more important. Uh, and I think that that has the ability to significantly affect and upend global order more than uh, ISIS and related terrorist groups. Um, I mean, you can see this in NATO member countries not being able to agree on their threat perception. You know, Eastern members see Russia as a greater threat. Southern members see, see ISIS as a greater threat, but mm -hmm. in both of those areas, Russia is uh, Russia's involved and they play a role. Um, and so that's kind of why I make the argument that we have to look at, you know, I do think great power politics is, uh, is inherently a, a bigger deal and uh, we should spend more time on that than fighting. So I want to connect that point that you just made about focusing on great power politics, focusing on, and you, you, you focus particularly on the Russian challenge to, to regional order and potentially the world order, but I want to connect that observation with 
an observation that, that you've been discussing and that you alluded to in your piece, which is that, that the think tank establishment really hasn't done a good job of making the case that uh, that American engagement in the world or American leadership in the world, however you want to describe it, uh, is is of vital importance to the lives of all Americans. What would that case look like? So let's say that I'm I'm not in the, the think tank establishment. I'm watching the election, and we talk about the importance of feelings. So Trump and Sanders, they say to the American public, I understand why you're losing. Income inequality is rising. We have a broken infrastructure. Uh, we have you know, racial issues. We have uh, issues of discrimination. We have a lot of issues that we need to, to work on at home. Wall Street is ripping us off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I, if I wake up in the morning and the metro isn't working, that affects my day-to-day -day life. If I wake up in the morning and I feel that my neighbors are getting ahead of me economically, but that I'm sitting, you know, my wages are stagnating, I, I can see the impact the, of those phenomena on my day-to-day -day life. But how do we make the case? Or, well, first of all, is there a case to be made? That would be the first question. And the second question is how to make it. Is there a case to be made that, okay, let's say that America were to retrench from world order and, and America to say, look, we have a lot of issues at home, which we do, income inequality and some of the other ones we've been discussing. We have a lot of issues at home. Uh, as President Obama said famously, you got a lot of flack for it. He said, the nation that I'm most interested in building is, is America. So if if we believe that we have a lot of issues at home, there's nation building to be done at home, um, how do we make the argument that American disengagement from the world would fundamentally jeopardize the lives of I guess I would start with what I would call the Walmart test, which is, um, you know, do you like your liter of milk for like a dollar fifty? Do you like any cheap stuff? Because if so, um, you gotta like global trade, for example. I mean, you know, you, you can probably make a, in a way, you could probably get a bigger wage if we were, you know, more jobs at home. But essentially, the less trade we do and the less globalization there is. <clears throat> The less your wage matters, right? You're, even if you made twenty thousand more dollars, eventually that dollar matters less because now the goods that are coming in are going to cost a lot more. That affects your daily life, right? Um, if uh, you want to go on vacation with your family and the rest of the world is in absolute turmoil, not necessarily because we disengaged, but because we might not have helped where we could have, that sucks. You know, I want to go to Egypt, but I'm probably not going to go anytime soon. Um, um, you know that. Uh, you know, so that, like, that, those kind of, you can make it tangible. Um, and a lot of these things are very tangible to everyday life. What I think is the tragedy of this election, especially with these two, is that they're not offering anything different. Mm -hmm. They're offering somewhat feeling, but Clinton is offering the status quo. Like, you like Obama, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna kind of do the same thing. Yeah, we might drop a couple bomb, more bombs, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then Trump is saying, remember, you like you don't like globalization, do you? Let's go before, let's go be the superpower of a pre-globalized world, or like a post-globalized world in a sense. Mm -hmm. They're not offering any new solution or new framework to global affairs. And that's, uh, I would consider a tragedy, and this is why a lot of, you know, these are familiar tropes that we're playing with, but there's nothing new, like, you have these problems, here are my new solutions and how does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. Right now, it's going off of the base instincts that we already have. And no one's tackling the day-to-day -day issues of this right Chris, I wanted to... So, first, if, if you would, you know, respond to Alex's observations. And I, I also, mean, based on your... When you, you really are into the, the you know, the weeds of the poem data. You understand the nuances and the... Sometimes the, the internal contradictions of American public opinion. But based on your analysis, so first the React analysis comment, but also based on your analysis of American public opinion, and, and granting that there are nuances and perhaps some internal contradictions. Can you discern some strands from American public opinion that are still supportive of broadly internationalism? Yeah. Um, so I think what Alex was talking about was, was sort of right in that there is there has to be a <coughs> values-based argument for American leadership abroad. Mm -hmm. You, you cannot win in the modern American marketplace of ideas on facts and rationality alone. You just can't. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You have to win on values and feeling, and hopefully some rationality too. Um, but as Trump shows, rationality is really not strictly necessary. Um, 
And, and one of the reasons of that, and that was sort of part of the piece that I'd written that you referenced earlier, is that the American marketplace of ideas has, has really changed over the last couple of decades, particularly with the advent of the 24-hour news cycle and uh, extremely partisan politics that covers the entire range of American activity, including foreign policy now. Um, you know, whereas before there was this whole sort of, you know, partisanship ended at the water thing that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and what has happened is the 24-hour news cycle has essentially allowed people to cherry pick single aspects of programs to critique the entirety of those programs, right? Like, you know, you want peace in the Middle East, great, and you want to broker uh, a treaty between Israel and Egypt, great. Oh wait, you're going to give Israel a bunch of fighter jets to make that happen? Or Egypt a bunch of fighter jets to make that happen? Well, that's horrible. I don't support that terrible thing there. Mm. Right? It's, it's, it's made things that would have happened in the past and the, the sort of the sweeteners, if you will, that it had to happen to make things happen, non-starters. Because people can really focus just on that, sort of to the absence of the larger issue. And that's why the value now is so much more important. Because the value sort of still permeates all through the whole thing. You can sort of justify the rest of it. Um, so I mean, I think that's, that's essentially the, the, the challenge, right? Is to sell American involvement abroad through a values-based agenda, but I do think there are still definitely themes in America that, that support a uh, an outward-looking America, and and the first and foremost of it is is still that sense of American exceptionalism. I mean, that's still very much a real belief. Uh, Americans still have a very strong belief that we are different, and to some extent we are better. How do you want to define that? And then part of that is that we see ourselves as good people. We see ourselves as heroes. You know, you watch the Westerns and the, you know, the war movies and everything else, particularly sort of the pre-Vietnam era ones. And, you know, we're, we're always the white hat. Um, and that still exists to a significant way, right? And that can still be tapped into. And I think that's actually what Hillary Clinton was trying to do in her speech last night to an extent, was to appeal to that sort of sense of we, we, are, we are the good guys. We can be the good guys. We just want to be, and if we want to be, we can make everything great. So that still exists. It's just finding an order uh, that can speak to that is, is a challenge. And you know, it could have been Obama's, but but he sort of got shellacked with the collapse in the economy, and, and that sort of threw everything else out on the side. And by the time the economy was back, it was sort of a state of pump life for him. One more question, I think, and Chris, I know you have to head out it. Like so, so I, but I did want to reference like another article you wrote. I believe it was also the National Interest. So when I when I think about it, let's sidestep you know, the the current you know, focus on the election. So it's, it's January 20th, 2017. The United States you know, inherits a very very complicated strategic landscape. But who are just a basic question? Who are our strongest allies? The reason I want to put the question to you is you had a piece arguing uh, and. and I didn't uh, write it down, so tell me if I'm mischaracterizing it. But I believe you were making an argument that a British exit from the European Union would be damaging. So yeah, I think, I think I, what did you say? That instead of a Brexit, we should remain? I didn't come up with that. <laughs> 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 Sounds like John. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, I'll win the referendum. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, so let's say, I mean, hypothetically, so let's say that the referendum is held, written, uh, decides to withdraw from the European Union. Um, how, one, how would that affect this, you know, this perennially invoked special relationship that we have with Britain? Um, how does it affect that relationship? And then two, who are our allies come, come early 2017? Who are our big, strong allies in this complicated world? Um, well, first of all, I'll say that I, I don't think that Britain is going to vote to leave the EU. And uh, that piece was written more from a viewpoint in Thinking, you know, if you are if you are the UK, here's the challenges that you would face. Uh, I don't I don't think a, a Brexit would shatter Europe. That's another headline that is right. But um, you know there are there are challenges if, if a Brexit were to happen. Um, the problem with the Brexit, I think, is that uh, it's been said that people that are pro Brexit 
say that, you know, if they leave the EU, it'll be fine. We'll negotiate a new free trade agreement with the United States. The problem is if you have so many other uh, issues on the table to deal with, that's going to be at the bottom of our priority list. So, yeah, I mean, Britain's still going to be one of our strongest allies, but I think that, uh, I think our NATO allies are going to be, uh, are going to be our strongest allies uh, in 2017 and beyond, uh, particularly France and Germany. Um, you know, Germany's playing a more active role in NATO, and that's something that we've, we've wanted from them for a very long time. That's something that you're seeing from them now. So, um, you know, I'm not arguing that Britain should leave, uh, should leave Did, you know, we, we could potentially weather the storm. It's just that uh, the special relationship would, would remain, but it would be a little bit more. Well, I have, I have so many more questions, actually, that I jotted down that I circulated to all of you over email, but I, I'm going to stop off now. I really want to open it up to folks. So if you have questions uh, for either all of the, all the <laughs> panelists, or if you want to direct a question to a particular panelist, uh, just raise your hand, identify yourself in an affiliation, and please make sure that the question ends with a question mark. <laughs> so, I'll open it up. Does anybody have a... Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what do you think foreign policy ranks on the list of concerns of the electorate? Do you want to direct it to a particular or just, nope. just any? Okay. I have an answer, by the way. Pretty low. Pretty low. Pretty, yeah. uh, it's, it is not terribly high. Um, but it is It's one of those interesting issues where foreign policy at large is very low, but foreign policy for specific items is actually much higher. So terrorism is the number two or number three most important issue, depending on sort of when it is. Um, when the poll is conducted, uh, and terrorism is functionally foreign policy. Uh, so, so there is that sort of dichotomy. Um, and I think if you mention other specific issues, it sort of goes up. And it's sort of that same thing we were talking about earlier with that, that uh, mental disjunction for people between what was your term for it? The chief uh, we're, we're low cost intervention. Uh, low cost intervention idea. Uh, not not, the, not to, to battle terms. I've always called it uh, kind of like go big and stay home. <laughs> 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 No, so it's always kind of like the, you know, it's, uh, it's that American trade of like, I want that really, really good thing, but I'd rather not do that much work to get it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I should say it's a millennial trade. Like, <laughs> no, no, that's an American trade. No, it's an American trade. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Straits of Malacca being open, or why we have an anti piracy mission off the coast of Somalia, you know, because of how it ties in. And then this also goes back to, I think, to, to the original question, which is the other two key hot button issues are foreign policy issues through the back door, which is immigration and trade. Mm -hmm. Because people would say, oh, those aren't foreign, 
foreign policy issue. Immigration is one because it gets at this whole question of borders, globalization, you know, a world of nation states versus an international border. And where you fall on that issue also you know, begins, it has an impact. So that, that kind of helps to encapsulate different worldviews. And trade, of course, because there's the sense of winners and losers and, you know, and, and how things are negotiated. So that, and then, of course, there's also the segmentation issue, which is that for different you know, subsets of American voters, different foreign policy issues matter more and matter less. So that we quote, you know, we, we talk about the average American, but we, we talk about Ukraine in certain neighborhoods in Brooklyn. That's a that's a that's a that's a number one issue versus in other parts where people probably can't find Ukraine on the map. So there's going to be some differentiation there. And then of course the candidates reflect that because depending on where these subgroups of voters are and whether they're in swing states and whether the state is going to be close or not, and historic interest in Cuba and there's you know, electoral votes in Florida <coughs> and the like. So in that sense there, you know, we've already started to see little bits of where among subsets of voters that there are foreign policy issues that are I mean, interestingly, I've always found that foreign policy, kind of like the presidency, cannot really make it, but it can break it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in that sense, you know, uh, sorry, did I say that? No, I said it's like a vice president. No, no, like, <laughs> my, no, like my friend as well, exactly. Um, you know, like, when, granted, it looks more prophetic now, but when Romney said, Russia's an own geopolitical foe, people went, ah, that's, you know, that's a problem. He's clearly not seeing the world correctly. Um, yeah, these, these kinds of things pop up once in a while, or you know, you can see Russia from your house or whatever, even though it's not her quote, but directly attributed to her somehow. <laughs> um, the, the, when these things pop up, it's almost, it just kind of knocks the person down a little bit, as long as you don't disagree, as long as you don't, if you don't agree with them. But at the end of the day, people go like, will my life be better? That's almost the ultimate question, not if, I, if you agree. The ultimate question is, like, is my life better with this person or with that person in the Oval Office? And foreign policy is like part of that, but mostly it's, will there be more money, will I have opportunity, all those kinds of things. Uh, but foreign policy, is, it, it, it definitely, like, I don't see anyone going, oh, he, that candidate wants to do more trade with Latin America. Fantastic. <laughs> um, like, you know, it's, it's just mostly, oh, I don't like Latin America now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other questions? <clears throat> don't be shy. Brianna, Hutchins, um, do you have any really strong feelings that uh, any particular wrong policies will be on the chopping block or very strongly supported for both candidates? Um, I mean, with Trump, who knows, you know, everything's up in the air. With Clinton, I think it's going to be uh, a continuation of a lot of Obama's policies, especially when it comes to the Middle East. Um, I think what's interesting is that when Obama was elected, we saw a continuation of one of Bush's policies in that he uh, uh, proliferated the use of drones in the region. And I think you could probably see that continue on to uh, a Clinton presidency as well. <coughs> so I, I think it would be like an Obama strategy plus in the Middle East. I think that she probably would have gotten in sooner in, in Syria. And if she's elected, I think that uh, it would be unsurprising to see her become uh, even more engaged and you know, support a, a Syrian safe zone, support more humanitarian aid, more aid to the rebels. Um, so a continuation, but and then some. I would say. I, yeah. I will say drones will probably be pretty big. Uh, yeah. And and I and I guess covert targeted kind of operations. That seems to be the return of Eisenhower and kind of foreign policy that come back. And Obama's really codified that. Um, he's made a way to. It's almost reflective of the American view, right? Like, mm -hmm. please do stuff in the world, but don't let me see it. And, mm -hmm. and don't let it cost yeah, us anything. And don't let it cost us anything. So we, even though it does cost money, it's in the black budget, it's OCO funds. Mm -hmm. so, it's ob so it's obviously not in the cost of any money. It's OCO. It's free. <laughs> it's, OCO. It's, free. it's free money. Yeah, it's the dollar store. Um, OCO, uh, overseas Contingency Operations uh, is where we were supposed to put <laughs> all our extra money in the DOD budget for Afghanistan and Iraq, and now as people are like, I don't like the amount of spending, we need more, just put it in OCO, okay, it's free. So the it budget doesn't grow. Correct, Correct. it's not considered part of like the, yeah, the official account yeah, in, in a sense. It doesn't have to uh, abide by the peace gate caps that were set back in 2007. It's a budget gimmick, so I, I would say drones and, and covert ops and special ops, I mean, they're, they've 
they just kind of made it. I mean, that, that fight between what DOD did and taking a lot of Intel functions and moving it into the Pentagon, I don't see that reversing anytime soon. And talk to, I mean, uh, I guess it kind of depends because any president is going to be constrained by political realities of, of the office, but I would be interested to see what you guys think about what might happen to the Iran deal under mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, the, the question is, let, so I think the problem we have with Trump is that he doesn't, you know, doesn't have a track record, he changes policies, he gives a statement, but if we use his speech here, we can do on foreign policy and see that that kind of reflects his view. Two things where I can see very big divergence is, and this goes back, Alex, to your point when you said, you know, he, harkens back to a pre-globalization and, and, you know, a 19th century deal. I could see that he would be open to saying, both with the Russians and the Chinese, let's kind of do a Congress of Vienna, let's sit down with the maps, oh, man. roll them out, <laughs> what's your sphere, what's our, you know. Now, that's not to say that they would reach an agreement, but I could see where he says, yeah, all right, so China, what are your claims on the South China Sea? What are the other ones? And then kind of, oh, let's just kind of arbitrarily take the blue pencil and this is what you get and uh, this is what others get. I mean, you know, it's like what they did in Vienna. And they said, okay, here's the line for these different... That may not, that, that was Trump a month ago. That may not be Trump in office if he's elected. But that would be a very good break to have an American president say, we are going to sit down and we're going to, you know, it's, the Kissinger's dream, right? It's not a nice world restored, Congress of Vienna, great powers sit, small, you know, smaller powers have to accept, right? Great powers are agenda setters, smaller powers are agenda takers. So you sit down, you say to the Chinese, you know, we're going to do quid pro quo. That would be revolutionary if that would happen. And if you, you know, they said, yep, we're going to give you, a, on Russia, we'll give you a firm guarantee, Ukraine will never be in NATO. We already had the former Georgian Prime Minister Surprised now he's still alive in Georgia saying, well, Georgia can be in NATO, but only when Russia approves, which essentially is never. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he said that, mm -hmm. um, that would be a major shift. That if you had an American president that said, yes, other powers do get now to have spheres of influence where they can exercise veto over American preferences. We will recognize that NATO can expand. And then, you know, the quick pro quo with the Russians is stop messing with the Baltic states, stop messing with Poland, none of these stupid overflights over Sweden. Mm -hmm. But in return, you get assurances on Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, China, stop messing with the flights, stop doing this, but, you know, we will we will recognize claims there. That would be a, if, if he did that, that would be an extremely major shift in U.S. foreign policy. Um, whether he's going to do it or not, I don't know. But conversely, with if you had a President Clinton and you had some people who suggested that America has been too restrained with regard to Russia and China and that a President Clinton would take some of the gloves off, mm -hmm. and also in Syria, that you know, America has limited what it has done in Syria, on Ukraine, on the South China Sea, and that a President Clinton would be more likely to, to, uh, to loosen the handcuffs of bit on, on American action. She might be more proactive there. Iran deal, I mean, again, you know, Trump talks about, you know, I'm a good negotiator, you know, 3,000 year history of Persian bazaars, and they're good negotiators, so we'll reopen the deal. But, you know, oh, the president, the current president, you know, he's going to face the fact that the deal will have hardened on January 19, 2017. It's hard to go back and reopen a deal that will now be. What's he going to do? He's going to get sanctions restarted. No other member of the Security Council will agree to that. Maybe they can, you know, do something on the missile test or something. So if that's a case going back to okay, what it says about you know, Trump's ability to deliver once he gets in, which is, you know, I'm going to change the Iran deal and then get into this stuff. I can't, not with that high cost, which Americans now say they don't want, which means they don't want to go to war with Iran because they thought the deal was bad. No, tangentially, I think, I think we make a point here. The, the, the tangential point, but I think is important, is there has been a massive shift of power in foreign policy to the executive. It was supposed to be kind of Congress, right, for a while, and now it's in the White House. And we've all kind of been okay with it because at least the people we've had in office have been decently rational. We may disagree with them, but, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be okay. 
we're at the point where this is now looking kind of scary, right? I mean, when, when McCain is saying like, well, I'm going to be, we're going to be okay because Congress has checks and we have the Supreme Court. Nah, it doesn't matter, right? He's, he, the president effectively now leads American foreign policy, and if Trump is in charge, kind of what Trump wants, Trump gets until he stops, and with what army? Although he runs the army, so um, it's I'm I'm worried about by the time and this is partially Obama's fault. He's running with more centralization of foreign policy in the White House. You know, now if he hands over the keys to Trump, which I don't think is likely, but even if he if he's in Oval Office now, he almost has. The ability to do whatever he wants with our everything arsenal, uh, and that when we talk about continuity or change, who knows? Because this is a guy who switches his ideas in mid sentence, and so it could be a really schizophrenic and really weird and really dangerous American foreign policy. Can I, can I just you back because the, there's a larger question, not just with Trump, but even with Clinton, which is given the way foreign policy is now so centralized in the White House staff, I can't, and, and we've seen now four. Three secretaries of defense under President Obama leave office, and even before the term is done, vociferous complaints. Mm -hmm. Who's going to want these jobs? Who's going to want to be Secretary of State mm -hmm. or Secretary of Defense in 2017 if the message is, yeah, you can, you can get the pretty office and the Pentagon are talking about it, but really, it's going to be some kid in the White House staff that's really going to be making the calls. You're just going to be a glorified errand boy. Um, that's another issue, is, is how are you going to rebuild uncentralizing the White House, and of course Trump may not have an incentive, and Clinton may not have an incentive, just as Obama and Biden ran and said, we're going to decentralize, we're going to stop doing all these executive orders, we're going to stop the signing statements, and then they got into, well, these are really great tools, and then they got a recalcitrant Congress that didn't want to pass anything, and then they really discovered how much they loved the executive authority. And now, yeah, now consider President Trump or President Clinton or any of the other, mm -hmm. and I don't know how that works, but it'd be really interesting to see who wants to serve, given this migration of power to the White House, who's going to want to be a senior cabinet official if they don't actually have substantive control over, over policy, if they just become glorified uh, errand boys. I mean, Clinton has a lot more choice than Trump on, yeah. on that front, at least, yeah. and more, at least, experience for policy hands. Uh, so I'd be less worried on that front with her than with him. But man, with him, I mean, he could put in someone from Trump International. I mean, as Secretary of State, he could put in Secretary of Defense as you know his like front gate men. You know, <laughs> who knows? Uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if. Someone, uh, it'd be interesting to see if I think Trump. I mean, I think Clinton would more likely do this than Trump. But you know, shrinking the size of the National Security Council, it's ballooned to like what over 400 people now. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering. We had a question over here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Tab Daly with the uh, Center for War Peace Studies uh, in New York. I put on my after work clothes. To turn mm -hmm. over. Um, Nick, just as an aside before I ask my question, that was a brilliant description of a, a hypothetical Trump foreign policy marching bravely back to the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of talk about making a case for American foreign external engagement by convincing Americans that it directly affects them. You know, how much does milk cost? And the freedom of navigation in the Straits of Malacca, what, how does it affect me? But I want to ask, if there, there, there are things going on in the world that don't directly affect either Americans individually or American national interests, but I want to believe that Americans care about them. I'll give you one of 999 examples. For two or three years now, hundreds if not thousands of Yazidi women were kidnapped two or three years ago, and they've been held in sexual slavery. Does it affect my life directly? No. Does it affect American national interests in some kind of a larger strategic sense? Not really. But God damn, I, I, I want the human community to do something about it. And I'm sure everyone in this room feels that way too. So the question is, from either a public opinion perspective or a foreign policy debate uh, perspective, is, is there some room for that kind of conversation? Things that don't affect us, but let's figure out what to do about these horrifying situations in the world. Chris, if you want to maybe take a look at that first. Yeah, I think that actually goes back to what I was saying about sort of the values agenda and appealing to that sort of American exceptionalism. I mean, Americans do have this sort of sense that that we are 
we're the good guys, and, and they do, when they hear stories like this, want to do something, right? And one of the challenges has been for, I think, American policymakers is balancing that out with the real cost limitations that have been sort of accrued through the foreign policy engagements we've had, right? So, you know, if we haven't been, haven't been living through the, the, the continuing sort of echoes of Afghanistan and Iraq, which of course created the situation you were referring to in the first place, but um, the president now would be freer to engage on that kind of issue, right? Uh, so, so there's this sort of tension between Americans do want to, to help out around the world, even if it isn't necessarily in their own interest, but there's that balance point between wanting to help and then seeing American service people die. That, that's a hard road to sort of navigate through the middle of. But yeah, I mean, that exists. That definitely exists. Um, that, that, that appeal to our better angels. I just want a quick follow-up on that. Do you have a sense of which, you know, on any, on any given day or you know, in any given decade, or obviously, or any number of humanitarian crises, humanitarian atrocities, do you have a sense, based on polling data or just anecdotal observations or conversations, of which, I'm trying to think of a way to you know, not some, you know, not you know, not put the question crudely, but are there characteristics or criteria that make certain humanitarian atrocities mobilize American public opinion more than mm -hmm. others? Is it is it a matter of location? Is it a matter of the scale of what's going on? But do you have a sense of what mobilizes? Sadly, yes. The more the victims of the atrocity look like Americans, mm -hmm. the more Americans respond to it. So. You know, and also, I mean, there's certainly a, a sort of a scale thing, you know, if there's some huge thing that happens, people want to contribute, want to help, mm -hmm. but, but that's why you see, you know, all sorts of horrible atrocities happen in Africa, and Americans don't really notice. They don't really notice, they're like, oh, that's horrible, but it doesn't necessarily fire them up the same way as, you know, uh, Christian enclaves in Iraq and Syria being, you know, uh, murdered and taken into slavery. Uh, that is something that is relatable to a lot of Americans who identify as Christian, mm -hmm. and, and and that mobilizes them in a way that that other things don't. And so it's it's sort of about that relatability. It's one of the, the key aspects. Can I ask a question? A lot of those. Well, no, I know, totally, it totally is. And, and that was actually part of what made the, uh, all the girls that were kidnapped by Boko uh, Haram become very compelling, is because they were sort of depicted, one, as victims of terrorists, which Americans the shit out of them, but two, that they were, you know, these young Christians, which may or may not have actually been accurate in the girls. And they were put in a cool YouTube video. Well, action. There's, there's, there's that too. That, 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 that I can't really speak to no, yeah. the whole insanity of the media effects. Uh, I was just going to ask uh, if you could talk a little bit too about how the response to, of Americans to environmental crises, um, earthquakes mainly, um, that we've seen, but as that is going to increase in the next years and definitely during the next presidency, and how do you think that the foreign policy is going to be tested? more routinely on a broad scale when it comes to these environmental disasters. I'll take a shot on because it ties into to your question as well. Um, I'm going to create a laugh because we've argued on this point for a bit. Um, I'll quickly address something you said, and I promise I'll tie it into yours. Um, the issues we're talking about with the Yazidis and stuff, if it, and, and stuff, the Yazidis, the Yazidis card, um, does it affect American statecraft? No. Mm -hmm. But will it affect uh, what you could term street craft, so to say? It could, because if you go on Twitter, you go on social media, you go anywhere, you know, images of, there's that image of the boy, you know, face down the beach, right? Which we, we all know it exists. We all know what I'm talking about, right? That was an indictment of the lack of American power, right? That is a challenge to what the United States was unable to do. You were unable to stop that boy from dying. Uh, what and then that hurts American press at large in the, the court of public opinion, which is now global. And so when you talk about state v state and statecraft, that's one act. 
That's one dimension now of global affairs. We've opened up a new one. And this is now how you feel along, how people feel about you. And we lost, I would argue, the street craft debate on all sides during the Arab Spring in Egypt, right? Those who wanted freedom hated us. Those in the government hated us. We didn't. No one knew what we stood for. No one knew where our policy was. There was a, there was a street craft component to that too. But we lost who we were and what we were going to do. And so then, when it comes to how are you going to act in the world? You know, does the easy thing affect me directly? No, it doesn't affect our statecraft, but it affects our ability to act at large, and definitely affects the way we view ourselves in sort of this exceptional way. Coming to environmental disasters, when it came to uh, that hurricane in the Indian Ocean, a tsunami, I'm trying to remember the exact moment, Hayan, I think it was? Hayan? Uh, there we go. Uh, you know, nothing, there was no statecrafty thing about that, although we do have an interest in having states in, in Asia kind of be stable. But man, is the streetcraft aspect awesome when you see an American aircraft carrier out there uh, allowing content as like a, essentially a roving hospital and American Red Cross and all that kind of stuff down there, troops helping out, settling the situation. It's not, you know, you build friends that way. You build allies that way from in government and out. And so when we talk about a, a retrenched America, yeah, I agree we overextend in many places, but we can't devalue the notion of American leadership in places where we can help, and then we got to be judicious, but in a narrative kind of way, explain our story. Who are we? This all comes down to who are we? Are, are we angels? Are we devil? Or are we just pra pragmatic players? And when it comes to environmental disasters, if that if you believe that's going to be one of the security issues of our time, I happen to agree, um, then that's a, that's a space we have to start acting in very quickly. I think I think that's a good point, but I think there's a there, there's going to be an important dichotomy. In that responding to sort of natural disasters, you know, your earthquakes, your tsunamis, that is a place that Americans will probably continue to be very heavily involved because it appeals to that sort of, I'm sorry, I lost the term again, the, the oh, cheap, but uh, right? Because it, it is a specific thing. You're going in to, <laughs> to help this, right? But you're fixing, you know, there's an earthquake, we're going to go under, we're going to build some houses, it's going to be great. Um, it's the greatest country again. Uh, but, but then if you're starting to talk about actually like the impacts of climate change and you know like the Seychelles like disappearing, like these real long term big picture like things, you're not gonna see a whole lot of American appetite for being involved in those because those are big long term investments and Americans don't like to work hard if we can avoid it. It's why we're actually a very innovative country, generally speaking, is because we're trying to avoid working hard. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me just oh, okay. you know, because this also touches on, I think, this distinction between immediate disaster, which is small scale and is tangible as one thing, but the longer. I mean, look, the, 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 the refugee flows, the migrant flows that are affecting Europe are environmentally driven. They're driven by drought, they're driven by uh, interconnection. You know, the Arab Spring was started in part by the great Russian drought of 2010, which when the Russians stop their wheat exports, prices go up in Egypt, the fall of heat, you know. Heat. We're seeing environmental connections to hard security in a way that we have not seen in the past. Then it begins to raise these other questions. Now we come back to the, what happens when more people want to move to Australia? What happens when how many millions of people on the other side of the Amur say Siberia's got a lot of empty land and because the permafrost is melting it's great agricultural land and 500,000 Russians living in this one district shouldn't preclude 20 million Chinese farmers from coming in. You're going to start to see things and I think partly this is where we go back to 19th, 21st century what you said before about the lack of visions because the 19th century view is we can have fixed borders and everything is stable. Um, the 21st century view that maybe we should be thinking about is we've seen these patterns in human history before. We're not exempt from it simply because we have cell phones and satellites. And look what happened to the collapse of the Roman Empire. That was ecologically driven, that was climate change, that was people, mass migration of population trying to find better places to live. We may be in a phase for that. And what's that going to do to a global system when 
states are states Seychelles disappear. Where does that population go? Mm -hmm. We create we carve out a Seychelles. We, we go to Australia and say, you don't need this province of Australia anymore. That's going to become new Seychelles. They actually are going to Australia, aren't they? Yeah. Haven't they bought that land? Yeah, there's like a land lease agreement. Yeah. They already have one. Yeah. South China. Well, China is doing some good work in South China Sea building some more. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the whole secret plan. It's not. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when this comes to that, you know, patterns of global cooperation. These are, you know, so the environmental questions are going to tie very much into hard security. And you're one candidate, I think, that just doesn't want to deal with that, and another candidate that may think about it, but knows that. Politically, that's not feasible and doesn't really want to touch those questions either because that's not what American voters want to hear in 2016 about you know, the world is changing and it's not necessarily in a good way. Hi, um, I'm Claire from the Institute of Military Diplomacy. Um, it seems as though the trend and conflicts that we're seeing today are stemmed by perceived threats to dignity or identity. And I wanted to know what you guys thought the trend would be, or the, the balance would be between soft and hard power with Clinton as president, if that is the case, how would she shift the balance between the two? Because in my opinion, the military doesn't have all the power in solving these identity issues. And so how do you think she would tackle these problems? I mean, I think Clinton in general, if you look at her, uh, her record, she tries to use all forms of diplomacy before using the military. You can see that in the way that she supported women's rights, gay rights. Um, she, she, she sees the value of the military, but she uses it as a tool of last resort. That being said, I do think that sh she is far more hawkish than, than Obama, and I think that she would feel comfortable uh, using the military arm of diplomacy more and more. But I think if you look at Look historically, um, she has tried to use other other matters before before the military. I mean, she, she when she was Secretary of State, she started like a global LGBT yeah, you can like you know women's campaign, uh, those two separate campaigns. Um, so I mean, yeah, I don't see how the military can go into like Saudi Arabia and say women have rights now. Uh, you know, we've We've had our military there for a while, and nothing's going to change. So, um, if it's going to have to be a, a diplom diplomatic effort, the, the question then becomes: Do other countries see the United States as like the leader in identity issues? Mm -hmm. And maybe we're moving that way somewhat, uh, but I don't see progress moving on that pretty quickly. And when Trump, if, if Trump wins or even if Trump loses, there will be a sort of, I would argue, a kind of social conservative backlash. And so then we lose that identity leadership with Clinton they have a chance of, of, of gaining it, but uh, you know, I I don't think the United States is anywhere near sort of like the moral le moral leadership standing on identity issues. That's probably um, you know some some parts of Western Europe and Scandinavia uh, at this point. Yeah the identity is also the kind in other ways. I mean again, you know, we circle back to the migration and immigration issues. Because those are identity issues mm -hmm. because you know who is you know, humans have ways of determining who is us and who is them. And you're striking directly as markers, religion, language, ethnicity, uh, definition of values. Uh, we just had a, I came earlier and we were helping to brief, uh, we were discussing with people on public diplomacy and we were talking a bit about the Russian propaganda campaigns of the last number of years. And the Russians have been very successful in a lot of parts of the world and mobilizing people to say America and Western Europe, so right, you said they're the leaders, right? They're going to have to destroy your identities, right? Uh, that's the message that the Russians bring to Eastern Europe. It's the message they are supporting with the rise of the new right in Europe. It's a message they bring to Turkey, uh, throughout much of Latin America and Asia and elsewhere is uh, these kind of global hegemons of the Euro-Atlantic world are seeking to destroy your identities. They're going to try to homogenize you, they're going to destroy your values, they're going to destroy your religions, they're going to destroy family life. And we've seen that the Russians get some payback, I mean, but obviously they've, they've seen a real return on that investment in Europe. Uh, with the rise of Jobbik, with the rise of the National Front in France, with uh, other parties that they've supported 
uh, financially and then in terms of, of, of providing that. So I think it's going to be a real pushback. Maybe we get to this question, because you, know, you said the U.S. has had its military in Saudi Arabia. Look at what the Soviet military did in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. where they forced a cultural revolution. They shot 20,000 mullahs in Afghanistan, the ones that said, were throwing acid in the face of women and women. They took them out and they shot them. And then they took thousands of people and sent them to the Soviet Union to be schooled. That goes against American values. We're not going to force our value. Our army in Saudi Arabia has never gone out and gone into Riyadh at the point of a gun and said, you will let women drive. We tell our women soldiers not to drive. We give them a bias and say, when you go off base, <laughs> here you go, put this on. Um, we have accommodated that. So it's interesting. It's interesting contrast, which is we have the power to remake the world or to try to remake it. We don't choose not to do it first because of the cost, but also because it's it's a contradiction. We believe in self determination. We'd like people to follow our way of doing things, but we're also not going to. We're not going to the Soviet. And that's what the Soviet Union did. I mean, you look at how many millions of people were killed in the Soviet Union and out elsewhere trying to get them to change their social systems, their values, their practices. Um, mixed success, and you can say Central Asia today, women in Central Asia are, are much better standard than they do in other parts of the Islamic world uh, because of Soviet social engineering. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the armed Mujahideen in the 1980s in Afghanistan precisely to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. and that was part of our doctrine. Let people choose their own ways and so, I mean, the identity things I think are going to become critical because we are going to have this challenge of our own values. Our own values inside this country are changing, or we're redefining what it means to be American, and then we're going to find that that could create problems uh, elsewhere because we have, we have allies that may or may not, and Japan. Japan does not share our belief that integration is good, that diversity is good, that integration it should be encouraged. <laughs> Was it they've taken in 20 Syrian refugees? Uh, their attitude towards refugees from other parts of Asia is, thank you, um, we don't want you here. Uh, go try to go to Australia. And yet our relationship with Australia has been impacted by this because Australians now have made it very clear that they don't want migrant flows coming in. These are going to be, I think, some of the more, as with the environmental issues, I think these are issues that 20th century national American national security doctrine does not prepare us for. You know, Brett Stokoff did not sit in 1989 worrying about climate change. He was not worrying about you know uh, rights of, of ethnic groups and lifestyle choices. It was you know how do I prevent the Soviet Union from launching 20,000 nuclear warheads against the United States? In some ways, he had an easier task in 1989 as the national security advisor. National Security Advisors moving forward well, uh, because the issues are going to be so different about what national security encompasses. So. Can I just follow up on that? So, um, what, what do you think about the idea that if you can remove a government, for example, in Iraq, that that is itself a very direct effect on the culture and the way that the people, even if they're not telling someone whether or not to wear something that's the color of the face? Right? And you can make this argument in lots and lots of ways. In just in the last 10 years, right, in Libya. Um, so, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm missing sort of the distinction between the, the, the sort of Soviet interest in aligning the population of places that they have a strategic interest in and the U.S., because it, it actually seems to me to be pretty similar. Um, no, I mean, I think the U.S. view was, well, you just remove an oppressive government and, and liberalism is the natural state of most most peoples. That is, most people are Americans just waiting to become Americans, and all you have to do is change the governing structure. And if you do that, then the inner Americans will come out. Uh, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so the approach was, we have to do social engineering, right? People are not going to conform this way until they're forced to do so, and, and therefore you're justified in using force. But yeah, I mean, the thing about Iraq, which is fascinating, is that we also, our view of Iraq was a 1970s, you know, when we went in 2003, we were thinking of Iraq as it was in the 1970s, which was very secular, and we completely missed the rise of religiosity in Iraq, and therefore when we removed an oppressive government in Iraq in 2003, we were unpleasantly surprised to find that 
It wasn't 1970s miniskirts and things that were flourishing. It was a return to a very different approach to community values and standards. And then they did not turn around and then say, okay, well, now we have to go in and root and branch, make the changes to the society. We, we continue to hope that somehow it will indigenously arise the way we would like it to. I guess that's where I would draw the distinction. Right, just, you know, from the perspective, and I think this is, this sort of does well by my, um, you know, idea that American people don't see results. You know, if you look at um, Iraq, which already was just going to be relatively secular, and now you have a lot of division, a lot of religious division that didn't exist before. And you definitely say a similar thing, right, the, the rise of the Taliban and the American intervention there. And again, these are just two examples. You can give you another example. It was relatively secular, and um, you know, religious division that used to be an enclave for, for Islamic State or other the like. So, I mean, you can, you can build the case why Americans are like, why on earth would we want to get involved? So you're sort of shrunken, you know, we'll just let Russia take care of it. Actually, he's, you know, explicitly said that in some debates, you know, well, you know, if he wants to, if, if, if Putin wants to bomb Syria, let them do it, and have to do it, and so forth. So, um, you know, record wise, I, I think, especially in, in the Near East, and, North Africa, there's not a lot of good examples of, hey, you went in and now it's a place that's, you know, small and all over. That's just the opposite. Right? It's, it's, um, it's become a, a much more illegal place, you know, particularly in the world. Any other questions? Yeah, do we know anything about who's advising Trump on foreign policy? Isn't it clear that? Yeah, this is me. This is you. Well, lucky me. Um, <laughs> So Trump has um, an interesting group of, uh, not my words, like third stringers advising him. And he says he's doing that on purpose because the pe even though people might have great resumes, um, you know, look at where American foreign policy has gotten us, especially after the Cold War, so why do I want those people? Um, he wants people with fresh ideas. And so he's got um, some people who you've heard of, I mean, Senator Jeff Sessions. Um, you've got Mike Flynn, who used to be the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, but then you've also got a guy who was in the Model UN in 2009 doing energy issues. Um, you've got Wally Farris, who some would say he's a scholar. I would disagree. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 scholars loosely term. Uh, loose term. Um, you probably, yeah, that's your Trump University. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's got those kinds of people. He's got a third string, again, not my term, but that's how it's largely characterized. Now, you might see that as a virtue, right? He does get a whole fresh new, the fresh new voices in there uh, and give ideas. However, when I, you know, people who, who are usually advisors on campaigns end up being governors as well, and not governors of states, like people who are in the process of governance, and none of these people have that experience. And so, you know, dovetailing back to the point of, uh, the NSC and the centralization of American power in the executive, those people will likely be the NSC or at least in some sort of important positions in our bureaucracies, and they're not going to know what to do. You know, ideas don't make policy. Ideas are the backbone of it, but then it's the implementation of it where it comes through. And I don't believe they're going to be able to pull it off. And so where I'm a little worried about where some of Clinton's advisors are, uh, at least many of them are, you know, know of the process of governance. Um, these guys don't really. And... You know, even if Sessions, who's been in the Senate for quite some time, got, became Secretary of Defense, or National Security Advisor, he has no clue about what that is. National Security and foreign policy haven't even been one of his main issues. And yet he's like the head of national security uh, for the Trump campaign. Christie knows a little bit about, um, you know, stopping progress on bridges, um, <laughs> which is, I guess, a good military tactic sometimes. Uh, so, you know, who, who knows? Uh, I'm, I'm actually less worried about their ideas because, you know, they'll, they'll probably end up coming up. Trump is the ideas guy. It's very clear that he's the ideas guy. He's not really being advised. <clears throat> he's being told what to say, and then he does his own thing. So what I'm most worried about is if he's voted into office, who's actually going to implement his foreign policy? None of those people know. Can I ask a follow-up from just for the people that are D.C.-based? Because, you know, the reports were sure. somewhat plugged in, sometimes not. Is there any sense that you had, of course, this whole never Trump movement? Yeah. All of these senior Republican officials, former officials, you know, people with the resumes. Mm -hmm. Is there any sense that some of them would try to square, to really split hairs and say, I'm not going to work for Trump 
when he announces a veep, if the veep candidate is respectable, I'm not really working for Trump, I'm working for the vice president. Mm -hmm. Would that yeah. be the way? Would there, or is there a sense that never Trump means so I, we're done? I, you know. I mean, you know, never, never means never anymore. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, oh, that was <laughs> never, never means never, 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 never means never. never. <laughs> No, I so you know a lot of news was made by those, I think it's now like a hundred and seventy something folks who signed that letter on War on the Rocks, an open letter of GOP foreign policy professionals who say they're never Trump and that he's dangerous for America. They got the headlines, but thousands of other GOP foreign policy professionals that didn't sign the letter didn't. Um, they're still out there. Um, and they're still probably, they're quietly waiting. They were probably hoping that he'd lose. Now that he has it, they're still quiet because, you know, I can probably justify working in a small CIA or State Department or DOD office mm -hmm. just to build my resume. No, I don't have to agree with them, but, you know, at least I get to be there. Um, there, I'm sure, I'm not also going to uh, deny the fact that some, I'm sure there's some in the DC mindset, the ability to find a way to justify in your mind that this, that would be a good idea. Uh, that even though I said never Trump, well, you know, it's it's fine. I'll make it work. I mean, hell, the Speaker of the House yesterday said Trump has clearly said some racist stuff. It's indefensible, but vote for him. Though. <laughs> And so, you, which by the transitive property is turned into vote for a racist. I'm not that good at math, but I think that looks pretty simple. Um, so, you know, I, yeah. It, yeah, people will show up. There's no question that people have some experience people working for him, but the ones that least close to him do do not have that experience. But if they did everything, you could have run essentially the vice president. I mean, people out, like a lot of yeah, but his vice presidential candidates are like Rob Portman, Chris Christie, Sessions, Bob Corker. The only one with any foreign policy experience is Bob Corker, but that's from the seat of the Senate. So, you know, can, can Corker be a good VP? Maybe. Uh, could he be a Secretary of State? Maybe. But, you know, who's, who's going to... The question I keep asking any Trump supporter or any Trump... Is back to it. Who is going to govern? And it looks like it's going to be Trump. <laughs> So, Chris, I know you have to head out and we actually have uh, gone past 7.30, so I think we should probably formally um, end now, but I don't know if, if any of you can stick around. I'll, I'll stick around. But I think I couldn't have asked, I mean, I learned so much. I couldn't have asked better than I think you can see why. These, so I commend their work to you, follow them on Twitter, read what they write religiously as I do, and please join me in thanking them for... Yeah, <laughs>